Hi, this is Rabbi Haim Kaufman. I want to welcome everyone to our special uh, Passover video. I want to speak about a few different things um, about Passover. You know, as we're busy cleaning, we have a few days left before the holiday itself. So we're busy cleaning, turning over, and our houses, you know, are turned upside down. You know, that the, the um, you know, the kitchen is turned over. The kitchen is all set for Passover, but you still have like a little place to eat your chametz. Uh, wherever that may be so we're busy you know in the final hours getting ready sort of going towards the uh, you know towards the finish line you know get everything done start cooking you know get ready for the Seder so I want to give a few ideas on the Seder um, on the Seder itself so the uh, one thing we have to keep in mind actually before I get to that one thing we have to keep in mind is the importance of what Passover represents. Right? Passover is a major, major tenant of Judaism. There are many things that we do that we say it's because God took us out of Egypt. That is, we say the Shema twice a day. Talks about coming out of Egypt. We have Kiddush Friday night. Talks about coming out of Egypt. The whole evening service. It's about coming out of Egypt and the miracles. We have a mezuzah on the door. Talks about coming out of Egypt. Fill in. Talks about coming out of Egypt. All these things. Major, major tenets within Judaism. Why? What's the purpose? Purpose is to show you that God runs the world. Right? So, how do I know? How do I know God runs the world? Because the Torah says, Exodus chapter 20. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, first of the Ten Commandments. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, because he took us out of the house of bondage. God's role in history. Now, nobody denies this happened. Not the Muslims, not the Christians. They may say we're not chosen anymore. God abrogated. You know, there's a new and improved version, so to speak, you know, of the Bible, even though we don't hold that. But they don't disagree. God gave us a Torah, and that we came out of Egypt. Now, we also have proof, at least 60-70%, we have visible proof that we were, you know, not only we were there, but we actually came out, which is pretty miraculous, because no nation ever escaped, right? No nation ever escaped from Egypt, that's why Moshe Rabbeinu does not want to go there. He does not want to try and take them out, because he understands, he looks up to heaven, and he sees that, through astrology, he sees that an angel of God, and an angel of the of the Egyptians, each nation had their own angel, right, to, to um, ask God to protect them or whatever the case was. So the two angels were intertwined like a double helix, right, like, like a DNA molecule. So in that case, Mojo Bainer looks up and he says, like, what do you want from me? I can't go there. It's impossible for the Jewish people to get out. So God says, well, don't I run nature? Aren't I in charge of nature? So if I'm in charge of nature, that means I can go above nature. So therefore, he tells Moshe, go tell them, come out. I'm going to show the world I'm God. I'm going to show the Jewish people. I'm going to show the Egyptians. I'll show the entire world. And each miracle that God does is above nature. Right? Totally above nature. So, God takes them out above nature, brings them into the desert, makes them into a nation, they come and accept the Torah, everything's great. But a lot of things going on, right, a lot, of, not just the miracles, right, but a lot of deeper things going on. So there's an obligation on Passover at night, the 15th of Nisan, and the next night also if you live outside of Israel, for a, a father to tell the story to his son, Right, the verse says in Deuteronomy, Vigadati Labincha. You have an obligation to tell over the story on that day. Right, on that day you have an obligation. So, usually a father is not going to lie to a child. And how did, this, how did that father know the story of coming out of Egypt? Because his father told him. How did his father know the story? Because his father told him. Right, going back all the way to Moshe Rabbein. But that's not so... You know, that's not so far-fetched. Because you, you could have had four generations at the Seder table. Great-grandfather, grandfather, father, and a son. 
At one time, that great grandfather was the youngest son. So if you have 80 of those generations, you go back to the giving of Torah Mount Sinai. Right? Not such a, you know, not such a big stretch. Not just a leap of faith, as we would say. So, the obligation to tell the story falls on the father and pass over at night. Now, we want the child to be awake to hear the story. At the very least, he's going to ask the four questions. Right? The four questions. He's going to say, what's the difference between this night and all other nights? On on all other nights, we eat chamei den matzah. Tonight we only eat matzah. Why do we, um, on all other nights, we eat other types of vegetables. This night only moror, only bitter herbs or bitter herbs. On all other nights, we only dip once. On tonight, we on Passover, we dip twice. On all other nights, we eat either reclining or sitting down. On this night, we eat reclining. So, the the youngest child, or if you don't have a youngest child there, or you don't have any children, so the adults ask, even if they know the story, even if they're wise, even if they're, even if they are um, erudite scholars, someone asks the question. Even, you know, again, even if you know all the intricacies, intricacies of the story, but... Normally we put our kids to sleep early so they can stay up and shine and ask all their questions, right? But when they ask this question, the obligation of the father to the son is to tell over the story. He hasn't fulfilled his obligation if the son doesn't hear the answer. So, parents, all you parents out there, your kids have to stay awake at least for this part to hear the story, right? Or to hear... To hear the answer. At the very least, they have to hear this answer. And the answer is, God took us out of Egypt. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. God took us out with a, a strong hand, outstretched arm. Even if God had not taken us out, we still, our children, our children's children, our children's children's children, etc. will still be subservient to Pharaoh in Egypt. Even if we're all wise, intelligent, erudite, we're old, and we all know the Torah, we have a mitzvah to tell over the story. Coming out of Egypt, go Marbel with Sapi, if you see Hasmin Srayim, raise them as Shubach. And anyone who tells over the story in great detail, right, tells it over a lot, goes on and on and on, raise them as Shubach. That is praiseworthy. So the child has to hear the story, right? The child definitely has to hear, or sorry, has to hear the answer that God took us out of Egypt. So there are a few things here. We'll see. We'll see uh, how far we get. There's a famous story with the Chovetz Chaim. Now the Chovetz Chaim uh, was speaking to a doctor, or he went to see a doctor, and this was at the time when there was tremendous, uh, a tremendous upheaval in the Ukraine. So it says Mori Rebbe, Aravagon Moshner Moshlita, he brings down that thousands of people were killed, butchered, sanctifying God's name. So Robert Chaim comes to this doctor, and the doctor starts asking him questions in Amuna about belief in God. The doctor says, How can it be all these thousands of Jews and they're killed and they're they are butchered and nothing happens? Seemingly it's quiet. God doesn't do anything. God doesn't take revenge. Right? Why does it happen? So the Chovetz Chaim doesn't say anything. The, the doctor continues, and the doctor says, you know, believe me, I start having, I'm starting to have doubts whether there's a God in the world at all. In other words, you know, if God's supposed to have compassion, and God's supposed to be all good, how could he do this, right? Famous question, right? Famous question with, you know, with Job, when bad things happen to good people. Why, why is this? He says, I have doubts whether... There's even a God in the world. 
So Chovetz Chaim on that answered the following. He says, how do I know? How do I know you're a doctor? You know, maybe you're some quack. Maybe, I don't know. You know, how, how do I know? What's your proof? Show me your proof that you're a doctor. So the doctor runs, and he comes to show, he takes off the wall, he comes to show his degree. His medical degree. So he says, look, I have a medical degree. How, how, can, how can you say I'm not a doctor? Hope Chaim looks at the medical degree. And he says, yeah, that's very nice. It allows you to practice medicine, but look at the date. The date's 40 years ago. How do I know that even though you're a doctor from 40 years ago, how do I know that you're still a doctor now? So the doctor said that, that at that time, when I took all these exams and I passed, you know, I passed all the exams, they gave me this degree. They're relying on me that I have this requisite knowledge to be a doctor, to be able to help people. But the doctor said, it's not like I have to take exams all the time. You know, I should update my learning here and there, but if I've already taken all the prerequisite exams, not like every day, every month, every year, I have to take more exams to prove I'm a doctor. Once I've proven I'm a, you know, I passed these exams before, that's enough. I don't have to take other exams. So the Chovetz Chaim said, God's the same way. God gave us the Torah. He gave us tremendous trials and tribulations through his Hester upon him, through God's hiddenness. But he did miracles as well. And the miracles, as we mentioned, he overturns nature. He makes miracles where the Jewish people come out of Egypt in order to accept the Torah. So he said, the Chovet Chaim said, these miracles prove that God runs the world. Remember, go back to Exodus chapter 20. And the first of the Ten Commandments is, Anoche Hashem Elokecho. I am the Lord your God. How do you know? Because the Torah says, because he took you out of Egypt, took you out of the house of bondage. That's absolute proof that he runs the world. He intervenes in history. So, so the Chofetz Chaim says, that, that's like his degree. That's like his stamp in the world. That he did an event, one event thousands of years ago, and that's enough to show he runs the world. Ah, you tell me. You see things you don't understand. You see people being killed and butchered, and seemingly God doesn't do anything. But does that mean he doesn't run the world? It means we don't understand why he's doing it. Doesn't mean it doesn't run the world. Right? So even though God Himself, as my Rebbe continues, He says, God Himself runs the world through Hester Beto Hester, Pony. Hiddenness within more hiddenness. Right? Well, what does that mean? It means we still have to keep the Torah even though God seemingly doesn't exist. It's as if He doesn't exist makes it a lot more difficult. And we still have to do His will. So the miracles that He did for taking us out of Egypt, that's His stamp. That's His stamp in the world that He runs the world. Ah, that was 3,000 years ago. Okay, so what's changed? You know, like God did that and He disappeared? No. He has a connection to His world. Why in the world, you know, would He make this world and then leave it? I say, okay, I did this, I did that, fine, and he left it. He intervenes in history. You know, 60, 70 percent of everything that went on in Egypt, we have proof for. With papyrus, other things, even if we don't have 100 percent, we have enough proof, enough physical proof, A, to see that they were there, that the Jewish people were there, and B, that they came out, which in itself is miraculous, because no other nation that was in Egypt, ever came out. Right? Nobody. It's not like, in this case, the underdog won. We always love to root for the underdog, and whatever it is. In this case, the underdog never wins. Put this in a supercomputer, a hundred times out of a hundred, a thousand out of a thousand, a million out of a million, they don't come out. Jewish people absolutely do not come out. 
So, this is an obligation in every generation that on the 15th of Nisan, we have to tell over the story. We have to go into great detail. Saying that God's stamp in the world of how we know he exists. And we have to know he exists through through education, through understanding. It's not just a leap of faith. It's not just, I believe. Right? We have proof. It's through knowledge that God runs the world. Therefore, therefore, there's also an obligation. As Augustus says later, that we have to see ourselves as if we came out of Egypt today. That the miracles that God did for the sake of the Jewish people and not only for them, for that generation, it's for everybody, for all future generations. We have to tell that over with great joy. Right, when we go through the Haggadah. Right, the one, one simple thing, or actually not so simple, but but uh, we'll, we'll just touch on that for a second. How do I do that? So we have to make it real. Rebbe Hesko Levenstein, Zechot Levrocha, may his name be blessed. He used to put benches in his living room, and he used to yell out, the Egyptians, they're coming, he used to act it out to make it real. So when we go through the Midrashim, when we go through the Torah, when it speaks about the miracles, we have to make it real. We have to see as if these things are happening. We have to imagine what it's like. We have to have a little bit of an imagination. You know, wild frogs and vermin and... I shouldn't say wild frogs. Frogs, wild animals, vermin, darkness. So if you have little kids, you've got to act it out a little bit. You know, put on a show. So right, how, how do you make a Seder for a three-year-old? A little bit difficult, but you have to give it over at their level. If you have multiple ages at your Seder, you got to make it livable or real for all of them. Each one at their own level. So, at the same time, not only did our forefathers come out, we also came out. So, maybe here tells, tells over a very important lesson. The lesson is, that you have one event in history that gave God or put his stamp in the world. God's stamp in the world is called Hashkacha Pratit. Or if you're more yeshiva, it's called Hashkacha Pratis. It means divine providence. There's nothing that happens in the world without God directing it. How do we know? Because he took us out of Egypt. Now, it doesn't matter if it happened 3,000 years ago. Doesn't matter if it happened 3,500 years ago. Doesn't matter if it was 4,000 years ago. However far back it goes, even though we're living in a time of Hester, but don't Hester upon him, that God himself has hidden himself because the temple's been destroyed. So regardless of that, and the fact that we don't really understand 100% what goes on today, what we see, as we mentioned before, that doesn't mean God doesn't run the world. It just means we don't understand why he does what he does. You know, we could go, you know, we could go way back and 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 discuss, which we're not going to now, we could discuss the idea of where the soul comes from. And that the soul is holy. And the soul needs nourishment, spiritual nourishment. If it doesn't get it, it's a problem. There's always a struggle between the physical and the spiritual. And because of that, our actions have repercussions. If our actions have repercussions, then God can change things and do things because of what we've done. But again, we don't necessarily see the measure for measure. When you look at the plagues, I'm not going to do this now, but if you look at the plagues, plagues are measure for measure. Certain things the Egyptians did, the, you know, each plague corresponds to what they did. But we're not always privy to that. So my Rebbe here brings out an important fundamental principle. A. God exists. B. God intervenes in history regardless of how we understand it. Meaning, even if, even if God is hidden today, we know that this event existed. We know that he intervenes in history. So because he intervenes in history once doesn't mean he just disappeared. 
We just don't, we just don't fathom how it works. That was the answer. That was the answer Chofetz Chaim gave to the doctor. Right, and every year of my Seder, my Passover Seder, so I always tell over the story, so we should never forget that whether we understand the way God runs the world or not is irrelevant. It doesn't take away from the fact that he does. I remember everyone's told me that, you know, if you're happy the way God runs the world 95% of the time, the other 5% you won't understand in five lifetimes, 10 lifetimes. All right, we don't understand. It doesn't mean he doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that, you know, he doesn't run the world. People ask the question, and they use it as a crutch, but they'll ask the question, how could God allow this to happen? Do you really care? In other words, you're really living your life the way God wants you to? If you're doing that, then you can ask the question. If you're asking the question, it's not a fair question. Because you have a doubt whether God exists. You'll say, well, if he did exist, then you should be doing all good. You understand what the goodness is? You understand in, in, in God's mind how it works? How he puts everything together? No, you just got a big ego. You just think you understand. Or you really probably haven't even thought of it. Never, you know, never read the Bible from cover to cover. Never even saw, you know, you never even saw the movie. So you don't know. Again, even if you studied for many years, we still don't know. We get a glimpse. We get an inkling every once in a while. That's very hidden. So Maria points out it doesn't matter that it happened once in history. Many, many years ago. Because they're no different than the doctor or anyone else that has this degree that practices whatever they practice that happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. They pass the record of exams to be a doctor, be a lawyer, be whatever it is. You don't question that after it. I mean, unless they got a faulty degree, then something else. But, you know, if they have a real degree and they pass what they have to, you, you don't question it. You may question other things, you're not questioning that. But that's what the Chofetz Chaim answered. You want to question God? I'm questioning you, you're a doctor. But you don't have to question me. It happened 40 years ago, but you're relying on the fact I did this. So all the time said, yeah, we're relying on the fact that God did that as well. Right? That he took us out of Egypt. One event. Doesn't mean he's not doing anything anymore. Doesn't mean he disappeared. That was the answer of the time to the doctor. <clears throat> now, as we continue, um, right after that it says, had God not taken us out, we, our children, children's children, would be subservient to Pharaoh in Egypt. That's a little bit hard to understand also. I mean, every nation has their day, for goodness sakes, even England. Even England had their day. They were world power at one time, hundreds of years ago. Even Portugal, even Italy. You know, but every nation, you know, is in power for a certain amount of time. You look at, you look at Russia, they lasted 70 years. You look at the Romans, the Greeks, a couple hundred years, 300 years. But eventually they're overtaken. Eventually they're out of power. Nobody lasts in power forever. Right? It's an impossibility. So what's, it, what's, it, what's going on here? How could it be that they never would have gotten out? So as we mentioned before, Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't want to take out the Jewish people. For one simple reason, he looked up into heaven and he saw through astrology that this angel of God, the angel of Egypt, were intertwined like a double helix, impossibility according to nature. hundred times out of a hundred, thousand out of a thousand, they don't get out. So if that's true, if that's true, then how are they going to get out? So God takes them out above nature. That's why I have the miracle. Miracles also there to show his might, his power. Of the other nations of the world and the Jewish people should know that he runs the world, that he's in charge. You know, there are no other gods except for him. And that's why the Jewish people have to kill the sheep and take the blood, put it on the doorposts. So God does not kill them in the plague of the firstborn, or the killing of the firstborn. God passed over, get it, passed over their house and killed the Egyptian. 
or any firstborn. So Marjorie Bader says that's what you have to do. You know, but they were but they killed the firstborn of the Egyptian. But even before that, they had to kill the sheep, which was the Egyptian god, one of the Egyptian gods, in front of them without them doing anything. And and by spilling that blood and putting it on the doorpost, that's how they got saved and came out of Egypt. That was the last thing. All the plague, all the suffering, everything else, if they didn't do that, they wouldn't come out. That's a little bit hard to understand. That's what Shabbos Agado is. Shabbos Agado is the Shabbos before Passover. It's to call the great Shabbos because of this miracle that took place. That they killed their God in front of them. That's why by Abraham, God says, your offspring are going to be a stranger in a strange land. They're going to suffer there, but I'm going to judge them. Why? Why are you going to judge them? They're fulfilling the divine decree. Answer is, God didn't say who was going to be. The Egyptians shoved up and said, we'll do it. And they did it so beyond what God wanted them to do, so they get punished also. So, so the Egyptian gods, you know, get slaughtered. The Nile was considered an Egyptian god. Turned to blood. That was the first thing. So God knocks off these other so-called gods, showing that, showing that they have no power. So it, it's interesting that otherwise, God doesn't do this, we don't get out. So according to nature, Jewish people are stuck there forever. Even though other nations had their day, had their power, irrelevant. This case never happened. We'll never get out. So God says, fine, Moshe, don't worry. I control nature. I'm in charge. Nature can never go against what I want it to do unless I will it. So, if the ocean says, I want to make an earthquake, and I want to destroy half of Southeast Asia, put Atlas back on the map, so to speak, you know, give them more income, I can do that. If I choose not to do it, the ocean can do whatever it wants, it's not going to happen. Nature cannot, is, is, is bound by laws. They cannot overcome their boundaries. Unless God wills it. So that makes life more difficult for us because if really God's in charge of an earthquake or a tsunami or any of these things, and then you see, you know, tens of thousands of people die, you ask the million dollar question, why? Why did you allow it to happen? Answer is we don't know. Test or punish. It's God's hiddenness. But that's where people come up with a question. Why did God do this and why did God do that? Like you're an expert. You're just throwing out a block question. You're not interested in the answer. You just want to say, I don't have to do anything. Oh, God did this? And God took away my family and did this? I don't want to have anything to do with him. All right, we don't understand why. But when, when, when a loved one dies that we have an obligation to mourn for, Right, whether it's a mother, father, sister, brother, God forbid, a child. So, before the burial takes place, you rip your shirt and you make a blessing. Right? You rip your shirt from your neck down to here. Let's say a little further down. And you make the blessing. Blessed are you, God, King of the universe, who is the true judge. You say, Baruch Dayan HaEmet. God is the true judge. Very hard blessing to make because you're in tremendous amount of pain. Because your loved one is sitting there and that's it. They're, they're gone. So what do you do when you make the blessing? What's the purpose of the blessing? The purpose of the blessing is not to lose focus. Right? The purpose of the blessing is to show God himself runs the world. Not an easy thing to do, but something we have an obligation to do. You know, we can blame all kinds of things on God. And say, look, he did this, he did that. You know, there are a number of things God's going to say. You want to blame me? No, no, you made a bad mistake. You have free will. You have free will. 
So I gave you free will. You made a mistake. You made a bad investment. I let it happen. I didn't stop it. There's a 614th commandment. Don't be stupid. You make a stupid decision. The repercussions are because you did it. So says the Malbim in, in the book of Job. We're very quick to blame God. But many times it may be our own fault. You know, God has to stop us from making every bad decision. Doesn't have to. He can. He can choose to when and when not to. Fine. But he doesn't have to. So we have to take responsibility for our own actions. But there are things that are beyond what we understand. And we have to admit there are things beyond what we understand. When, we think, when things go haywire, we see innocent people die. It's beyond us. We can't give answers. We don't know why. For some things, we may be able to speculate. All right, but that's all it is, is speculation. All right, the only people that have prophecy today are either little children or fools. I.e., there is no prophecy today. Even though the great rabbis today, the, the, that some may have divine inspiration, that's the lowest form of nevuah. The lowest form of prophecy. Be that as it may, we don't know. What we do know is we're not here to judge. We're here to live no matter what he tells us, no, no matter what happens. We live by a code. The code is called the Torah. It's not a five-year option to renew. It's not like the Jews ate the same hallucinogenic mushroom in the desert and they all came up with the same thing. It's about belief. It's about bedrock belief. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. Because if it, if it changes, then it just fluctuates. Then it means you do whatever you want. That's not Torah anymore. That's just a watered-down, diluted form of something that doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because it's false. And it can't be passed down. So here you see an amazing thing. Here you see that Jewish people never should have gotten out. But God put them there and had to take them out early. They were supposed to be there for 400 years. They came out two, after 210 years. The reason they came out is because God's afraid they are going to disappear spiritually. 49 levels of impurity. They hit level 48. God has to take them out. So that asks another question. Why did God put them there in the first place? For right, whatever reason, they had to be put. They had to be put in Egypt. God understood what he was doing. One explanation, possible explanation. As far as Emma's second gear Rebbe says that they had to go down there and serve a mortal king. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu grows up in the house of Pharaoh. He has to understand what kingship is because he's the first king of Israel. Right? He's the de facto king. He's not a crown king, but he's known as the king. So if he's the king, he has to know what kingship is. So he had to learn and sit in the house of a king to be able to give over what the king of kings is. So afterwards he flees and then he brings out the Jewish people but well, we have to understand what kingship is. Shmon Esrei, Silent Meditation, 19 Blessings. At the very beginning, we take three steps back, and then we take three steps forward and we bow. And there are different places in the Shmon Esrei we bow. And at the end of the Shmon Esrei, we take three steps back. We bow to the left, we bow to the right, we bow to the center. Why is that? Because that's how you approach a king. That's how you take leave of a king. So you got to say, but we don't have a connection to kingship. How are we supposed to know what it is? And the way you're supposed to know what it is is because Moshe Rabbeinu grew up in the palace of the king. No coincidence that his mother put him in a basket. He floats down the river because there was a decree. All male children should be killed because, because Pharaoh saw through astrology that the savior of the Jewish people is going to go through water. So he tells all the midwives, etc. to kill Jewish babies in the in the river, Jewish male babies. And it's interesting enough, the one male that is going to overthrow him and destroy him and his people is going to be the one that grew up in his house. Right? The one who grew up 
uh, in the palace. So for him, he had to understand kingship. He had to be able to give over kingship to the Jewish people. So they had to serve, according to the Rebbe, they had to serve a flesh and blood king in order to know what it means to serve the king of kings. Again, it's ironic that where does he learn it from? He learns it from Pharaoh himself. You know, Pharaoh with all his, you know, wise men and sorcerers and everything else, you know, didn't even think that the person who's going to save the Jewish people is the one he's going to raise. But that's why, at least this one idea why Moshe is there and why he had to be there for so long so he could learn what it means to serve a king uh, to serve a king in this world now the end of this says that we still have to ask the question even even if we're all wise etc and if you tell the story more you know that's praiseworthy so, Passover to me is in some ways a, you know, it's an interesting dichotomy. It's an interesting dichotomy because there's an obligation we mentioned for a father to tell over the story to the son. Now what happens when the kids come home, you know, they learn in school, they learn all kinds of things about, about coming out of Egypt, about the miracles, about other things. So... They come home, you start to say to them, they start bam, 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 saying all these things. So I always have to remind my kids, I'm the one telling the story, not you. My obligation is our obligation to tell it over. Yeah, you have a lot to say, we'll let you say, don't worry. It's a night to let the kids shine. It's their night to give over the coming out of Egypt and put it in their bones, put it in their kishkas, make it alive. That's how it's kept for future generations. Even if you're eating three pounds of matzah and you have to whistle Dixie afterwards. And the maror and the cleaning and, you know, all these other things that go on. That makes, you know, Passover what it is. It's a, um, it's a tremendous thing for the kids to see, kids to partake, kids to help out. But you can't let them take over the Seder. <laughs> that, you know, that kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. You can let them speak. Again, it's not like you're shutting them up. You, you're letting them shine. You want them to shine. You want them to tell over different things. But the essence of the story and the, and the, the purpose of what you're doing is for the father to tell it over. Right? At least the father gets in a few things. The kids get in the rest. Right, which, you know, which again is you know is, is an important thing because kids want to participate, kids want to show, you know what they you know what they learn, but you also want to give over, and that's why the Rambam changes the the the, the version a little bit, because we say that you that we have to see ourselves as if we came out of Egypt. All right, that's what it says towards the end of of uh, before we eat the matzah, before we say. Before we explain what matzah is, what maror is, right, right after, sorry, right after we explain what matzah maror is, um, and the Paschal offering, right, that's exactly what we say. We say, um, uh, we say right after, we say right after, we say right after, and every generation, Every generation, we're obligated to see ourselves who came out of Egypt. Shanemar, because the verse says, He got it to Labincho, Bayomahu Lemur, Bavor Zesa Hashem, Lib, and Sezi Mimitzrayim. That the Torah says, How do I know? You have to, every, every generation, you have to see yourself who came out of Egypt. It says in Exodus chapter 13, verse 8, You got it to Labincho, Bayomahu. This is what your father told his son on that day. He's saying, because of this, God took you out of Egypt. So the Rambam has a little bit of a different version. 
Here it says you have an obligation to see yourself as you come out now. As if to say, I'm coming out now. Right? That's the reenactment of it, so to speak. Or even before that, seeing yourself as you came out of Egypt means you're telling over the story with great joy. You're telling over the miracles with great joy. How, how are you doing that? Because you have matzah also. Matzah, Amara. The Rambam had a different version. Rambam had a different version. His version was, Bekol Dor Vador in every generation, Chayv Adam Lehei Ra'ot. Lehei Ra'ot is the same root of Lir'ot. Reish I Alev He, to see. But it's in a different form. Lehei Ra'ot means to demonstrate. Demonstrate is not the same thing as seeing. Demonstrate is more active. So in this case, you have to really, you know, it's not enough just to sing. Right? My Herbie explains that's what it means to sing, you know, with, with uh, great joy. Tell over the story with great joy. But it also means you have to act it out, it would seem. Demonstrating means you have moths in front of you. You have moror, bitter herbs in front of you. Because on that day, that's what it is. That's the mitzvah of the day. Matzah, moror, plenty of matzah. <laughs> but that's what it is. So demonstrating, we could look at what Rechaz Levenstein, Zechot Tzadik of Rochel said. May his name be blessed. Or what he did, really. Took two benches. Right? In his living room. And he walked through them, going, explaining, this is, you see, it's Mitzrayim. This is the coming out of Egypt. The Egyptians, they're coming. Made it real. See, Passover is a time. You know, when you go into the Haggadah. No matter who's there, you have to make it real. You have to say over things that make it real. That make it hit home. Because if not, it's just a story. Unfortunately, many people go through the story very quickly. Read through it, rub it up, double it, see, that's it. Unfortunately, many don't even do it on the right day because they do it too early. It has to be done at night. So some people start it so early. You start at 5 o'clock, 5.30. Let's say sundown is at 7.30. Quarter to eight, you could have gone through the four cups, the whole story, eat the piece of, you know, last piece of matzah, the afi komen, which represents the Paschal offering, and be done. But you're done before it's even sundown. Doesn't make any sense. You did it on the wrong day. They know it's a thought that counts. You know, at least we did a Seder. All right, you did a Seder. It just you did it on the wrong day. You know, for whatever, you know, for whatever it's worth. You read the story, you don't really speak about it. It doesn't really mean that much. You know, at the very least, hopefully the kids heard something. You know, hopefully they heard something. Of what Passover is, what the miracles are. You know, but if you don't live it, it doesn't stick. You don't want to clean out your house. You want to have, you know, you want to eat a little bit of matzah with other stuff. That yeah, may be worth something. It's not going to go into your kishkas, though. It's not something that your kids going to say, oh, I so much want to do this. It's like a drag. Why don't, you know, why don't I want to eat this bad food for? Why don't I want to, you know, stab and go through this Passover Seder? Be with family. Like, come on, get real, get a life. I got stuff what to do. All right, so what if it's Passover? It doesn't mean anything. The Haggadah itself, we go through the night of Passover, or two nights outside of Israel. She goes through the Haggadah the entire week. And there are many, many Haggadahs out there that are great to go through, great commentary. You know, on what's going on, what's transpiring, what are the questions, why isn't a question and answer for? There are a ton of stuff here. You know, that, you know, we're not even going to discuss. Or maybe in, you know, in future years, you know, we'll go through other things. But there's such a richness 
to what it is. And you have the ability to give it over to your kids and pass it down. If we pass it down properly, regardless of what may go on in our lives, right, we instill in our kids a faith that not only God exists, but he runs the world regardless of whether we understand it or not. And if things don't go our way, it means we have to work on whatever we need to work on. It means we have to work on our faith in him even if things are bad. That's when the faith is the strongest. You know, a person has a lot of money in the bank, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't pray as well. If things are going bad or they're shaky, certainly prays a lot better. But shouldn't we pray at the outset the way we need to? Regardless if we have money in the bank or not. When we're in trouble, very easy to pray. But God puts us in the situations for a reason. What's the reason? That's a good question. Many times we'll never know what the real reason is. But it could be you put us in these situations, just one idea, in order to bring out a character trait that's dormant, that in no other way could have been brought out except in this case. You say, well, could have happened a different way? Could have. God didn't want it to. And because he didn't want it to, at the end of the day, you brought out things of yourself you didn't even know you had. Right? You brought out these dormant character traits you didn't think existed. You didn't think you could handle. You didn't think you could do. Whatever the case is. So in the end, we don't want repercussions. We don't want uh, um, trials and tribulations. We pray every day we shouldn't have them. But at the end, we don't grow without them. There's a little bit of a catch-22. So, one last thing. Passover... You know, we're talking about chametz. Chametz, any leaven product, is compared to the eight Sahara, the evil inclination. Now, the evil inclination we have to fight on a daily basis, right? The good inclination, the bad inclination. When we go according to our good inclination, we uproot our body and soul. When we go against it, we debase the body and the soul. So, chametz means physical leaven products. We have to get rid of and sell, or we don't get rid of, uh, we have to sell the non-Jew before Passover. But the idea is that Chomets is also part of us, meaning every person goes through their own Yitziat Mitzrayim, their own coming out of Egypt, whatever it is. Nisan's the month of Geula, the month of redemption. Right? It's in a very, very auspicious time. If we do what we're supposed to do, redemption can come. If we don't, we continue in this bitter exile. So as we finish getting ready, changing over and scrubbing and cleaning, take a little bit of time you know, go through the Haggadah a little bit. Scrub a little bit of your soul. Let your soul be scrubbed. So your soul can shine. Because at the end of the day, that's all we have. How we serve God in this world. Did we do what he wanted us to do to the best of our ability? Did we reach the plateau? Or were we just pretenders? Or we just want the easy way out. As we say, Ufitsar Agra, no pain, no gain, right? According to the you know, according to the amount of effort is the reward. Anything that comes easy doesn't stick. You know, going through this process, being a Jew or converting to Judaism. You want to be the real deal. You don't ever want someone to second guess. This is what, you know, this isn't what Judaism is. You want to show this is what Judaism is. This is what it represents. That's why you have to live it. Living it in difficult times is hard. And God says, you know, I don't care. Just shut up and eat the matzah. This is what you have to do. This is what's going to bring the ultimate redemption. And that's the idea we have to take home, use it through Passover, 
and take that, you know, throughout the year. I also give conversion class to anyone interested. Take a look at my um, Facebook fan page, Beyond Orthodox Conversion uh, to Judaism. I also have a class in Derech Hashem, even if you don't want to convert. It talks about um, man's purpose in the world, why God created the world, uh, prophecy, the nations, it's whatever. Very, very interesting uh, from the Ramchal and Derech Hashem. Anyone interested can, can certainly uh, contact me at Rabbi Chaim Kaufman at gmail.com, R A B B I C H A I M C O F F M A N at gmail.com. And everyone have a Chag Kasher Vesameach.